Part One of the Indiscreet Letter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Indiscreet Letter by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. Part One. The railroad journey was very long and slow. The traveling salesman was rather short and quick. And the young electrician who lolled across the car aisle was neither one length nor another, but most inordinately flexible, like a suit of chain armor. More than being short and quick, the traveling salesman was distinctly fat and unmistakably dressy in an ostentatiously new and pure-looking buff-colored suit, and across the top of the shiny black sample case that spanned his knees, he sorted and resorted with infinite earnestness a large and varied consignment of ladies' pink and blue-ribbed undervests. Surely no other man in the whole southward-bound Canadian train could have been at once so ingenious and so nonchalant. There was nothing dressy, however, about the young electrician. From his huge cowhide boots, to the lead smouch that ran from his rough, square chin, to the very edge of his astonishingly blond curls, he was one delicious mess of toil and old clothes, and smiling blue-eyed indifference. And every time that he shrugged his shoulders or crossed his knees, he jingled and jangled incongruously among his coil boxes and insulators like some splendid young Viking of old, half blacked up for a modern minstrel show. More than being absurdly blond and absurdly messy, the young electrician had one of those extraordinarily sweet, extraordinarily vital, strangely mysterious utterly unexplainable masculine faces that fill your senses with an odd, impersonal disquietude, an itching unrest, like the hazy, teasing reminder of some previous existence in a prehistoric cave, or, more tormenting still, with the tingling psychic prophecy of some amazing emotional experience yet to come. The sort of face, in fact, that almost inevitably fires up into a woman's startled vision at the one crucial moment in her life when she is not supposed to be considering alien features. Out from the servient shoulders of some smooth-tongued waiter it stares, into the scared, dilating pupils of the white satin bride, with her pledged hand clutching her bridegroom's sleeve. Up from the gravelly pick-and-shovel labor of the new-made grave, it lifts its weirdly magnetic eyes to the widow's tears. Down from some petted princeling's silver-trimmed saddle-horse, it smiles its electrifying, wistful smile into the peasant's sodden weariness. Across the slender white rail of an always outgoing steamer, it stings back into your gray, landlocked consciousness, like the tang of a scarlet spray. And the secret of the face, of course, is lure. But to save your soul, you could not decide, in any specific case, whether the lure is the lure of personality, or the lure of physiognomy, a mere accidental, coincidental, haphazard harmony of forehead and cheekbone and twittering facial muscles. Something, indeed, in the peculiar set of the young electrician's jaw warned you quite definitely that if you should ever even so much as hint the small sentimental word lure to him, he would most certainly swat you on first impulse for a maniac and on second impulse for a liar, smiling at you all the while in the strange little wrinkly tissue around his eyes. The voice of the railroad journey was a dull, vague, conglomerate, cinder-scented babble of grinding wheels and shuddering window frames, but the voices of the traveling salesman and the young electrician were shrill, gruff, poignant, inert eternally variant, after the manner of human voices which are discussing the affairs of the universe. Every man, affirmed the traveling salesman, sententiously, 
Every man has written one indiscreet letter during his lifetime. Only one, scoffed the young electrician with startling distinctness, above even the loudest roar and rumble of the train. With a rather faint, rather gaspy chuckle of amusement, the youngish girl in the seat just behind the traveling salesman reached forward then and touched him very gently on the shoulder. "'Oh, please, may I listen?' she asked, quite frankly. With a smile as benevolent as it was surprised, the traveling salesman turned halfway round in his seat and eyed her quizzically across the gold rim of his spectacles. "'Why, sure, you can listen,' he said." The traveling salesman was no fool. People, as well as Lale Thread, were a specialty of his. Even in his very first smiling estimate of the youngish girl's face, neither vivid blonde hair nor luxuriantly ornate furs misled him for an instant. Just as a preacher's high waistcoat passes him, like an official badge of dignity and honor, into any conceivable kind of a situation, so also does a woman's high forehead usher her with delicious impunity into many conversational experiences that would hardly be wise for her lower-browed sister. With an extra touch of manners, the salesman took off his neat brown derby hat and placed it carefully on the vacant seat in front of him. Then, shifting his sample case adroitly, to suit his new twisted position, he began to stick cruel little prickly price marks through alternate meshes of pink and blue lail. "'Why, sure you can listen,' he repeated benignly. "'Driving alone's awful stupid, ain't it? I reckon you were glad when the busted heating apparatus in the sleeper gave you a chance to come in here and size up a few new faces. Sure you can listen.' Though, bless your heart, we weren't talking about anything so very specially interesting, he explained conscientiously. You see, I was merely arguing with my young friend here that if a woman really loves you, she'll follow you through any kind of blame or disgrace, follow you anywheres, I said, anywheres. Not anywheres, protested the young electrician with a grin, not up a telegraph pole he requoted sheepishly. "'Yes, I, I heard that,' acknowledged the youngish girl with blithe shamelessness. "'Follow you anywheres was what I said,' persisted the traveling salesman, almost irritably. "'Follow you anywheres. Run, walk. Crawl on her hands and knees if it's really necessary. And yet—' Like a shaggy brown line drawn across the bottom of a column of figures, his eyebrows narrowed to their final calculation. And yet, he estimated cautiously, and yet there's times when I ain't so almighty sure that her following you is any more specially flattering to you than if you was a burglar. She don't follow you so much, I reckon, because you are her love as because you've got her love. God knows it ain't just you, yourself, she's afraid of losing. It's what she's already invested in you that's worrying her. All her pinky, posy, cunning kid dreams about loving and marrying, maybe, and the pretty much grown-up winter she fought out the whiskey question with you. Perhaps in the summer you had the typhoid, like clearer than not, in the spring the youngster was born. Oh, sure, the spring the youngster was born. Gee, if by swallowing just one more yarn you tell her, she can only keep on holding down all the old yarns you ever told her. If by forgiving you just one more forgive you, she can only hang on, as it were, to the original worthwhileness of the whole darned business. If by... Oh, that's what you meant by the whole darned business, was it? cried the youngish girl suddenly, edging away out to the front of her seat. Along the curve of her cheeks, an almost mischievous smile began to quicken. "'Oh, yes, I heard that, too,' she confessed cheerfully. "'But what was the beginning of it all, the very beginning? What was the first thing you said? What started you talking about it? Oh, please, excuse me for hearing anything at all,' she finished abruptly. "'But I've been traveling alone now for five dreadful days, all the way down from British Columbia.' 
and if you will persist in saying interesting things in trains you must take the consequences there was no possible tinge of patronage or condescension in her voice but rather instead a bumpy naive sort of friendliness as lonesome royalty sliding temporarily down from its throne might reasonably contend with each bump a king may look at a cat he may he may along the edge of the young electrician's cheekbones the red began to flush furiously he seemed to have a funny little way of blushing just before he spoke and the physical mannerism gave an absurdly italicized sort of emphasis to even the most trivial thing that he said i guess you'll have to go ahead and tell her about rosie he suggested grinningly to the traveling salesman yes oh do tell me about rosie begged the youngish girl with whimsical eagerness who in creation was rosie she persisted laughingly i've been utterly mad about rosie for the last half hour why rosie's nobody at all probably said the traveling salesman a trifle wryly oh pshaw flushed the young electrician crinkling up all the little smile tissue round his blue eyes oh pshaw go ahead and tell her about rosie why i tell you it wasn't anything so specially interesting protested the traveling salesman diffidently we simply got jollying a bit in the first place about the amount of perfectly senseless no-account truck that'll collect in a fellow's pockets and then some sort of a scorched piece of a paper he had or something got him telling me about a nasty sizzling close call he had today with a live wire and then i got telling him here about a friend of mine and a mighty good fellow too who dropped dead on the street one day last summer with an unaddressed typewritten letter in his pocket that began dearest little rosie called her a honey and a dolly girl and a pink-fingered precious made a rather foolish dinner appointment for thursday in new haven and was signed in the lord's own time at the end of four pages yours forever and then some tom now the wife of the deceased was named martha quite against all intention the youngish girl's laughter rippled out explosively and caught up the latent amusement in the young electrician's face then just as unexpectedly she wilted back a little into her seat i don't call that an indiscreet letter she protested almost resentfully you might call it a knavish letter or a foolish letter because either a knave or a fool surely wrote it but indiscreet mm, no well for heaven's sake said the traveling salesman if you don't call that an indiscreet letter what would you call one yes sure gasped the young electrician what would you call one the way his lips mouthed the question gave an almost tragical purport to it. "'What would I call an indiscreet letter?' mused the youngish girl slowly. "'Why, why, I think I'd call an indiscreet letter a letter that was pretty much of a gamble, perhaps, but a letter that was perfectly, absolutely legitimate for you to send, because it would be your own interests and your own life that you were gambling with.' not the happiness of your wife or the honor of your husband a letter perhaps that might be a trifle risky but a letter i mean that is absolutely on the square but if it's absolutely on the square protested the traveling salesman worriedly then where in creation does the indiscreet come in the youngish girl's jaw dropped why the indiscreet part comes in she argued because you're not able to prove in advance you know that the stakes you're gambling for are absolutely on the square i don't know exactly how to express it but it seems somehow as though only the very little things of life are offered in open packages that all the big things come sealed very tight you can book them a little and make a guess at the shape and you can rattle them a little and make a guess at the size 
but you can't ever open them and prove them until the money is paid down and gone forever from your hands but goodness me she cried brightening precipitately if you were to put an advertisement in the biggest newspaper in the biggest city in the world saying every person who has ever written an indiscreet letter in his life is hereby invited to attend a mass meeting and if people would really go you'd see the most distinguished public gathering that you ever saw in your life bishops and judges and statesmen and beautiful society women and little old white-haired mothers everybody in fact who had ever had red blood enough at least once in his life to write down in cold black and white the one vital quivering questioning fact that happened to mean the most to him at that moment but your honey and your dolly girl and your pink-fingered precious nonsense why it isn't real why it doesn't even make sense again the youngish girl's laughter rang out in light joyous utterly superficial appreciation even the serious traveling salesman succumbed at last oh yes i know it sounds comic he acknowledged wryly sounds like something out of a summer vaudeville show or a cheap sunday supplement but i don't suppose it sounded so specially blamed comic to the widow i reckon she found it plenty heap indiscreet enough to suit her oh of course he added hastily i know and martha knows that tompkins wasn't at all that kind of a fool and yet after all when you really settle right down to think about it tompkins name was easily tommy and thursday sure enough was his day in new haven and it was a yard of red flannel that martha had asked him to bring home to her not the scarlet autumnal veil that they found in his pocket but martha i says of course martha it sure does beat all how we fellows that travel round so much in cars and trains are always and forever picking up automobile veils dozens of them dozens red blue pink yellow why i wouldn't wonder if my wife had as many as thirty-four tucked away in her top bureau drawer i wouldn't wonder says martha stooping lower and lower over tomkins blue cotton shirt that she's trying to cut down into rompers for the baby and martha i says that letter is just a joke one of the boys sure put it up on him why of course says martha with her mouth all puckered up crooked as though a kid had stitched it on the machine why of course how dared you think forking one bushy eyebrow the salesman turned and stared quizzically off into space but all the samey just between you and i he continued judicially all the samey i'll wager you anything you name that it ain't just death that's pulling martha down day by day and night by night, limper and lanker and clumsier footed, Martha's got a sore thought. That's what ails her. And God help the critter with a sore thought. God help anybody who's got any one single solitary sick idea that keeps thinking on top of itself over and over and over, boring into the past, bumping into the future, fussing, fretting, eternally festering gee compared to it a tight shoe is easy slippers and water dropping on your head is perfect peace look close at martha i say every night when the blowsy old moon shines like courting time every day when the butcher's bill comes home as big as a swollen elephant when the crippled stepson tries to cut his throat again when the youngest kid sneezes funny like his father who was rosy who was rosy well who was rosy persisted the youngish girl absent-mindedly why rosy was nothing snapped the travelling salesman nothing at all probably altogether in spite of himself his voice trailed off into a suspiciously minor key but all the same he continued more vehemently all the same it's just that little darned word probably that's making all the mess and bother of it because as far as i can reckon a woman can stand absolutely anything under god's heaven that she knows but she just up and can't stand the littlest teeniest no account sort of thing that she ain't sure of answers may kill em dead enough but it's questions that eats em alive for a long speculative moment the salesman's gold-rimmed eyes went frowning off across the snow-covered landscape 
Then he ripped off his glasses and fogged them very gently with his breath. "'Now I ain't any saint,' mused the traveling salesman meditatively, "'and I ain't very much to look at, and being on the road ain't a business that would exactly enhance my valuation in the eyes of a lady who was actually looking out for some safe place to bank her affections. "'But I've never yet reckoned on running with any firm,' that didn't keep up to its advertising promises, and if a man's courtship ain't his own particular personal advertising proposition, then I don't know anything about anything. So, if I should croak suddenly any time in a railroad accident or a hotel fire or a scrap in a saloon, I ain't calculating on leaving my wife any very large amount of sore thoughts. When a man wants his memory kept green, he don't mean gangrene. Oh, of course, the salesman continued more cheerfully. A sudden croaking leaves any fellow's affairs at pretty raw ends. Lots of queer, bitter-tasting things that would probably have been all right enough if they'd only had time to get ripe. Lots of things, I haven't a doubt, that would make my wife kind of mad, but nothing I'm calculating that she wouldn't understand. There'd be no questions coming in from the office, I mean, and no fresh talk from the road that she ain't got the information on hand to meet. Life insurance ain't by any means, in my mind, the only kind of protection that a man owes his widow. Provide for her future, if you can, that's my motto. But a man's just a plain bum who don't provide for his own past. She may have plenty of trouble in the years to come settling her own bills, but she ain't going to have any worries settling any of mine, I tell you, there'll be no ladies swelling round in crepe at my funeral that my wife don't know by their first names. With a sudden startling guffaw, the traveling salesman's mirth rang joyously out above the roar of the car. "'Tell me about your wife,' said the youngish girl a little wistfully. Around the traveling salesman's generous mouth, the loud laugh flickered down to a schoolboy's bashful grin. "'My wife,' he repeated. "'Tell you about my wife?' Why, there isn't much to tell. She's little, and young, and was a schoolteacher, and I married her four years ago. And were happy ever after, mused the youngish girl teasingly. No, contradicted the traveling salesman quite frankly. No, we didn't find out how to be happy at all until the last three years. Again his laughter rang out through the car. Heavens, look at me, he said at last, and then think of her. Little, young, a schoolteacher, too, and taking poetry to read on the train, same as you or I would take a newspaper. Gee, what would you expect? Again his mouth began to twitch a little. And I thought it was her fault, most all of the first year, he confessed delightedly. And then all of a sudden, he continued eagerly, all of a sudden, one day, more mischievous, spiteful than anything else, I says to her, we don't seem to be getting on so very well, do we? And she shakes her head kind of slow. No, we don't, she says. Maybe you think I don't treat you quite right. I quizzed, just a bit mad. No, you don't. That is not exactly right, she says, and came burrowing her head in my shoulder as cozy as could be. Maybe you could show me how to treat you righter, I says, a little bit pleasanter. I'm perfectly sure I could, she says, half laughing and half crying. All you'll have to do, she says, is just to watch me. Just watch what you do, I said, bristling just a bit again. No, she says, all pretty and soft-like. All I want you to do is to watch what I don't do. With slightly nervous fingers, the traveling salesman reached up and tugged at his necktie as though his collar were choking him suddenly. So that's how I learned my table manners, he grinned, and that's how I learned to quit cussing when I was mad round the house. And that's how I learned, oh, a great many things. And that's how I learned, grinning broader and broader, that's how I learned not to come home and talk all of the time about the peach whom I saw on the train or the street. My wife, you see, she's got a little scar on her face. It don't show any, but she's awful sensitive about it. And, Johnny, she says, don't you ever notice that I don't ever rush home and tell you about the wonderful, slim fellow who sat next to me at the theater, or the simply elegant grammar that I heard at the lecture. I can recognize a slim fellow when I see him, Johnny, she says, and I like nice grammar as well as the next one, 
But praising em to you, dear, don't seem to me so awfully polite. Bragging about handsome women to a plain wife, Johnny, she says, is just about as raw as bragging about rich men to a husband who's broke. Oh, I tell you, a fellow's a fool, mused the traveling salesman judicially. A fellow's a fool when he marries who don't go to work deliberately to study and understand his wife. Women are awfully understandable if you only go at it right. Why, the only thing that riles them in the whole wide world is the fear that the man they've married ain't quite bright. Why, when I was first married, I used to think that my wife was awful snippety about other women. But, Lord, when you point a girl out in the car and say, Well, ain't that girl got the most gorgeous head of hair you ever saw in your life? And your wife says, Yes, Jordan is selling them puffs six for a dollar and seventy-five this winter. She ain't intending to be snippety at all. No, it's only, I tell you, that it makes a woman feel just plain silly to think that her husband don't even know as much as she does. Why, Lord, she don't care how much you praise the grocer's daughter's style, or your stenographer's spelling, as long as you'll only show that you're equally wise to the fact that the grocer's daughter sure has a nasty temper, and that the stenographer's spelling is mighty near the best thing about her. Why, a man will go out and pay every cent he's got for a good hunting dog, and then snub his wife for being the finest untrained retriever in the world. Yes, sir, that's what she is, a retriever, faithful, clever, absolutely unscarable, with no other object in life except to track down and fetch to her husband every possible interesting fact in the world that he don't already know. And then she's so excited and pleased with what she's got in her mouth that it most breaks her heart if her man don't seem to care about it. Now, the secret of training her lies in the fact that she won't never trouble to hunt out and fetch you any news that she sees you already know. And just as soon as a man once appreciates all this, then joy is come to the home. Now, there's Ella, for instance, continued the traveling salesman thoughtfully. Ella's a traveling man, too. He sells shotguns up through the Arostook. Yes, shotguns. Funny, ain't it, and me selling undervests. Ella's an awful smart girl, good as gold. But cheeky? Oh, my. Well, once I would have brought her down to the house for Sunday, and advertised her as a peach, and a dandy good fellow, and praised her eyes, and bragged about her cleverness, and generally done my best to smooth over all her little deficiencies with as much palaver as I could, and that little retriever of mine would have gone straight to work and ferreted out every single solitary, uncomplimentary thing about Ella that she could find, and have fetched him to me as pleased and proud as a puppy, expecting for all the world to be petted and patted for astonishing shrewdness, and there would sure have been gloom in the Sabbath. But now, now, what I say now is, wife, I'm going to bring Ella down for Sunday. You've never seen her, and you sure will hate her. She's big and showy and just a little bit rough sometimes, and she rouges her cheeks too much, and she's likelier than not to chuck me under the chin. But it would help your old man a lot in a business way if you'd be pretty nice to her. And I'm going to send her down here Friday, a day ahead of me, and, oh, gee, I ain't any more than jumped off the car Saturday night when there's my little wife out on the street corner with her sweater tied over her head, prancing up and down first on one foot and then on the other. She's so excited to slip her hand in mine and tell me all about it. And Johnny, she says, even before I've got my glove off, Johnny, she says, really, do you know, I think you've done Ella an injustice. Yes, truly, I do. Why, she's just as kind. And she's shown me how to cut my last year's coat over into the nicest sort of a little spring jacket. And she's made as a chocolate cake as big as a dish pan. Yes, she has. And, Johnny, don't you dare tell her that I told you. But do you know she's putting her brother's boy through Dartmouth? And you, old Johnny Clifford, I don't care a darn whether she rouges a little bit or not. And you ought not to care either. So there. End of part one.